I have been um, reading uh, sort of new poems for some around uh, this winter, and I'm tired of them, so I'm going to read some I haven't, a couple I haven't read in a while um, that I miss. This is Saint's Logic. Love the drill, confound the dentist. Love the fever that carries me home. Meat of exile, salt of grief. This much indifferent affliction might yield. But how when the table is God's own board and grace must be said in company? If hatred were honey, as even the psalmist persuaded himself, then Agatha might be holding her breasts on the plate for reproach. The plate is decidedly ornamental, and who shall say that pity's not at this remove? Her gown would be stiff with embroidery, whatever the shape of the body beneath. Perhaps in heaven, God can't hide his face, so the wounded are given these gowns to wear and duties that teach them the leverage of pain. Agatha listens with special regard to the barren, the dry, to those where, with tumors where milk should be, to those who nurse for hire. Let me swell, let me not swell. Remember the child, how its fingers go blind as it sucks. Bartholomew, flayed, intervenes for the tanners. Catherine, for millers, whose wheels are of stone. Sebastian protects the arrowsmiths and John the chandlers because he was boiled in oil. We borrow our light where we can. Here's begging the pardon of tallow and wick. And if, as we've tried to extract from the prospect, we'll each have a sign to be known by at last, a knife, a flour sack, a hammer, a pot. The saints can stay. The earth won't entirely have given us up. I was spending some time roaming around in um, saints' lives and the logic of patronage as connected to the narratives of martyrdom was very bizarre to me. And I thought, well, that's Catholics for you, you know. So, so, so you have your breasts cut off and then you are prayed to forever by nursing mothers and women with breast cancer, which, you know, is actually interesting, I decided, really interesting. Um, yeah, I wrote that poem before, um, I knew I was going to need to pray to Agatha myself. Um, I suppose this is on, this continues on a religious theme, but we're um, changing confessional identifications at the moment. This is called Good News. We are in, um, we are no longer in the um, high church. One, the hobbled, the halt, the hasten to blame it on childhood crowd, the undermined and over their heads, the hapless, the humbugs, the hassle may nots. The night before the night my uncle Gents saw Jesus standing in the hayloft, he, my uncle Gents that is, considered cashing the whole thing in. Bettina gone the way she had, the boys all gone to hell. The mild, flat light of evening lay like a balm on the fields, but for his heart no balm in sight. So Gents gave all his money to the local charismatic, and in exchange his fellow faithful told him to forgive himself. God's God-forsaken children all over the suburbs and the countryside are dying in the service of a market share. Witness the redhead I used to go to college with 
who played the trombone and studied Kant and now performs the laying on of hands in eastern Tennessee. Beneath her touch, quenched sight returns. The myelin sheath repairs and lets the wheelchair rust. The cancerous cat comes purring back to health. But gents, whose otherworldliness imperfectly cohered, took to driving his pickup off the road in desultory fashion for the most part so that Cousin Ollie's cornfield took the brunt of harm. The hens ran loose and gents who in his mother's arms had leapt for joy and in tow-headed youth had leapt to favor in each tender heart went weary to salvation. Two, Having learned from a well-meaning neighbor that death will not have her if Jesus does first, my three-year-old daughter is scouring the visible world for a sign. The other she's found in abundance, death on her dinner plate, death in the grass, and drawing just conclusions is beside herself with fear. Most Englishmen, the Archbishop said smoothly, are still residual Christians. We still need a clergy for funerals. The televet, that was Robert Runs. I mean, bless his heart. Okay, so he was asked, what's the point of becoming Archbishop of Canterbury, isn't it all? So, we still need a clergy for funerals. The televangelist's plexiglass pulpit, the crystal veil of his tears, Assure us the soul is transparent too. No stone can break nor scandal mar the radiant flow of video conversion. Close now, closer than audio enhancement, the frictionless story that washes us clean, words disencumbered of contingency, of history, of doubt, God's Wounds, they swore, the old ones, the believers, as now we swear by sex or shit. God's wounds, which failures of attention made. The connection to this next poem, which actually is going to be in the new book, um, is that myelin sheet. It's sort of, there's a, there's, a, there's a medical connection here. Um, but this poem, um, like Cody's wonderful poems, though I can't claim more than that, um, comes from a, from a little prompting uh, that I, I, had to, I had to decide, was this going to be um, an epigraph or a title? And I need to find, yeah, here's the page. Um, I finally made it a title. There was a new biography of Flannery O'Connor out a few years ago, and I have not, to my shame, yet read the biography. But I did read a review, and um, there was a spectacular quote in it, and it was just, I mean, we should all have bravery like this. Um, Flannery O'Connor, when she was terribly, terribly ill um, with lupus and had to give up, had had to give up her life in New York, had had to give up her life amongst friends in the culture, had got to go home, basically, to live out the rest of her life, carried on very energetic correspondence with friends and um, describing she had, I mean, this it was, she was very hard for her to move at this point. She wrote, um, with consummate spirit to a friend back in New York that, that the um, lupus, the autoimmune disease from which she was dying and had watched her father die, was more instructive than a long trip to Europe. So that's the title of this poem, um, and it really is meant to be tribute to her. More instructive than a long trip to Europe, the wolf, she meant, the lupus, which we also yoke with butterfly. Broad curves across the cheekbones, finest lesions, and the narrow bridge across the nose. 
What can I tell you, says body to soul, to make you understand? There is a system so exquisite in solicitude for every least unlocking that sustains you, every atom scanned for friend or foe. It forms the very script of self-cohering. In its zeal sometimes, it goes too far. As if where you'd always thought home was, they should suddenly take your papers away and ask you why you've come here and no phone calls while you're plotting harm. The body turns against itself. And why should it not be brilliant in this newest fevered cause as in its every other aptitude? Salerno, late 12th century. Roger Frugard writes his book in thinking wolf bite gives disease a name. No way, of course, to know the inner workings. But he has his Galen, has his university, medieval on the Roman stones. Its lovely crenellations grace the painting in my guidebook. And he has his eyes. A king has come to kneel before the surgeons, see his many retainers, the weight of his robes. Behold the faith we've always placed in learning and the feral counter-argument encoded in the blood. I got commissioned to write a poem, which is always my very favorite thing, because it means I actually have to do it. Um, and this was for a wonderful exhibit at the Folger Shakespeare Library called Shakespeare's Sisters, and it's an exhibit of their holdings and writings um, by uh, and about early modern women writers. And it's completely gorgeous, so we all have to like catch a plane to Washington before it closes. Um, and I wrote a love letter to um, my favorite early modern woman writer, Isabella Whitney who wrote a fabulous mock will and testament um, that she published in 1573. She published two books, 1567, 1573, for money. She makes it very clear that in a time when that wasn't decorous, she's not, she hasn't, it hasn't been pirated and stolen by well-meaning but misled friends, you know, who were really supposed to keep it in manuscript circulation. No deniability. She just like flat out buy my book. And she, she professed to be having to leave London because she was like, had turned, been turned out from her position and, um, and didn't have enough money to stay in the city. So she sort of, in her departure, um, kind of left the city to itself. Um, it, so the, it, it, it's the, the, the epigraph, this is a, sort of about her poem called the, In the Manner of Her Will and, and Testament. It's called Getting and Spending, One. We're told it was mostly the soul at stake. It's formal setting forth as over water, where against all odds, the words on paper make a sort of currency, which heaven, against all odds, accepts. So will, which is to say, may what I purpose please this once, and what will happen coincide. To which the worldly dispositions were mere afterthought, your mother's ring and so forth, what the law considered yours to give which in the case of women was restricted. This was long ago and elsewhere. So that one confessedly weak of purse might all the more emphatically be thought of as having little to say except about the soul. The late disturbance in religion having done that much, the each for each responsible, even a servant, even the poor. Wild then, quite beyond the pale, to hustle the soul part so hastily off the page and turn our Isabella Whitney to the city and its faithlessness, whose smells and sounds, the hawker's cry, the drainage ditch in Smithfield, all the thick-laid, lovely, in-your-face-nostril stuff of getting by, no woman 
of even the slightest affectation would profess to know, much less to know so well. As one would know, the special places on his body were the passion merely personal. Two, wattle and brickwork, Marble and mud, the city's vast tautology. No city without people, and no people, but will long for what the city says they lack. High ceilings, gloves and laces, news, the hearth-lit circle of friendship, space for solitude, enough to eat. And something like a foothold in the whole of it, some without which not, some little but needful part in all the passing from a hand to hand of it, so every time the bondsman racks his debtor or the shoemaker hammers a nail or one unpracticed girl imagines she has prompted a look of wistfulness, a piece of it is yours because your seeing it has made it that much slower to rejoin the blank oblivion of never having been. The year was 1573, the year of our Redeemer, as they used to say, that other circuit of always in your debt, from which she rested in her open, I am writing not for fun, but for the money way of authorship, a world not just plenty, but, and here's the part that's legacy, of love. Um, I am never, ever able to write short poems, but I wrote one, um, <laughs> which I'm going to end with. Um, and it's my love poem. My friend David Baker said, when he saw the manuscript in an earlier version, he said, Linda, you know, it's great. I, you know, I like it. Um, but I could, how about I like a love poem? I mean, you don't, so this is not a love poem to David. In, in, in an oblique sense for David. Um, it's to someone else. Uh, slight tremor. The fine fourth finger of his fine right hand. Just slightly when he's tracking our path on his iPhone or repairing the clasp on my watch. I will not think about the myelin sheath. Slight tremor only transient. So the flaw in the pavement must have been my mother's back.